year, and uh, co-sponsoring it with the Vermont Bookshop, and books will be available, and I'd be happy to sign them and personalize them in, in the back after uh, my talk. Um, the the uh, Vermont Humanities Council is an extraordinary group of people. They are the stewards and the benefactors and the curators of the arts in Vermont, our other gorgeous landscape. They deserve our generous support. I will subdivide my talk tonight into five stages of the Weimar Republic, as suggested by Peter Gay, the late Weimar scholar and Sterling Professor of History at Yale. Those who cannot remember history are condemned to repeat it. The words of George Santayana, the Spanish philosopher, essayist, poet, and novelist. Santayana enjoins us to recognize the echoes of painful history and do what we can to prevent its recurrence. It is our unfortunate nature to project evil onto others as if we are not capable of it ourselves. In considering the history of Nazi Germany, we do so at our peril. The Third Reich rose to power during Germany's Weimar democracy that followed World War I. Germany, the nation that brought us Bach, Beethoven, Brahms, Goethe, Schiller, Mann, and others, society with free elections and the rule of law. A plurality of Germans voted for Hitler's party and he became chancellor in 1933 through legal parliamentary processes. Jochen Bittner, guest columnist for the International New York Times, noted a few months ago that there, are f there were four conditions that cleared the path for the fall of the Weimar democracy and the rise of the Third Reich. Economic depression, the loss of trust in institutions, social humiliation, and political blunder. I would suggest, though not identical, these conditions exist again today. History is an imperfect but compelling mirror that helps us to consider the present. In a time of economic distress, Germans hoped that Hitler would make Germany great again. Ordinary citizens responded to the appeal of demagogues who used fear, populism, xenophobia, nationalism, bigotry, and scapegoating, and the promise that an authoritarian ideology would save Germany from its decline at the hands of the other. Hitler's campaign was one of violence against individuals and groups dependent on fear, utilizing inaccurate historical analysis and outright lies to mobilize a vulnerable population. The Nazis demonized the press and developed a propaganda campaign of savage efficacy. They threatened the judiciary. Few could envision the horrific outcome. So how did this come to be? Tonight, I want to consider three questions. First, Hitler and the Nazis rose to power in a constitutional democracy. Ordinary people made free choices. Why did they choose Hitler and the Nazis? The history of the Weimar Republic is a compelling and tragic drama. Did Weimar contain the seeds of its own destruction? And finally, what can we learn from this history as an immunization against recurrence? My new book, Before the Court of Heaven, as historical fiction, animates and illuminates the history of Weimar Germany and the rise of the Third Reich as a cautionary tale for our time as well. I tell the stories, real and imagined, of individuals embedded in this history. As a writer, I use the, partic the particular to focus a larger reality. History has the quality of fractals, similar patterns <coughs> occurring at progressively smaller scales. We glimpse a larger whole through examination of quotidian details, the ordinary lives that we can relate to, that are the subatomic particles of history. This is what I have tried to capture in Before the Court of Heaven. My hope is that by animating this history, you, dear reader, will recognize the capacity inherent in us all for unspeakable horror and remarkable goodness, our devils and our better angels. We, too, have choices to make. I am a local pediatrician and a writer. I am not an historian. My first book, Life in a Jar, The Irena Sendler Project, is nonfiction about the Warsaw Ghetto and three contemporary Kansas teens who discover a Holocaust hero's forgotten story. The research required to write Life in a Jar was prodigious. 
I felt rather like a graduate student preparing a <laughs> doctoral thesis. My new book, Before the Court of Heaven, Historical Fiction, required even more research to ensure historical accuracy. I first heard this story of the redemption of Ernst Teschoff, a young fascist assassin, a proto-Nazi, in a Yom Kippur sermon at Middlebury College in 1992. It was based on a 1943 report in Harper's Magazine. Yom Kippur is the holiest day of the Jewish calendar, a day of atonement, a day to seek God's forgiveness for our transgressions, a day to turn from evil, to shuva in Hebrew, and redeem ourselves. I felt compelled by this young assassin's story, and I sought primary evidence. I obtained microfilm of transcripts from the Library of Congress of Ernst Teschel's arrest, his interrogation, and Leipzig in October 1922. So, paper accounts and scholarly works of the trial and of Weimar Germany, and the history grew larger and more fantastic. Ernst's trial, the organization Consul trial, was actually the trial of 13 mostly young fascists and violent nationalists who were trying to bring down the fledgling Weimar democracy. Although German was my first language, I didn't speak English until I was five, I needed help with this translation. Marita Schein, Marita Schein, raise your hand, there she is. <laughs> A shout out to Marita Schein. Um, she and I sat together right here in the Ilsley Library every Tuesday and went through the transcripts frame by frame. And I owe Marita a deep measure of gratitude. <laughs> the first half of my book is mostly true, with the addition of fictional characters to flesh out historical persona. At some point, the paths of novelist and historian diverge, but not so sharply as you might think. And one path informs the other. Consider my two epigraphs. Art is a lie which makes us realize the truth. So, and what is, if not the mirrors we hold up to our Wally Lamb. Part one of Before the Court of Heaven is titled Histories and accurately recounts the struggles of Weimar Germany's early years and the rise of the Nazis. It is an invitation to consider how ordinary Germans became complicit in extraordinary crimes. Let's begin with the indoctrination of young people, with the development of a youth culture in Germany before World War I. My characters, Ernst, Lisa, and Fritz, spend their summers as Wandervogel, wanderers or wandering birds, a popular movement of German youth dating back to the 19th century. The ethos was to shake off the restrictions of society and get back to nature and freedom. Soon these groups split and there originated ever more organizations, which still all called themselves Wandervogel, but <coughs> were philosophically distinct. By the early 20th century, they occupied a broad spectrum from Jewish, liberal, hippie-like von der Vogel to militaristic, nationalistic, anti-Semitic von der Vogel. It was a back-to-nature youth organization emphasizing freedom, self-responsibility, and the spirit of adventure, with a nationalistic approach stressing Germany's heroic Teutonic roots. In much the same way that Weimar became Nazi Germany, what began as an innocent, even commendatory German youth movement, the von der Vogel, became the Hitler Youth. Hitler is necessary but not sufficient for the rise of Nazism. He is an opportunist and a gifted orator, but the Weimar democracy itself contains the seeds of the Third Reich. Hitler and circumstances do the rest. Hitler is born in 1889. By the age of 16, he is living a bohemian life in Vienna. He becomes an orphan at 18 and works as a casual laborer and a painter, selling watercolors of Vienna's sites. The Viennese Academy of Fine Arts rejects him twice. He runs out of money, and he lives in homeless shelters and men's hostels. Vienna is a hotbed of religious prejudice and racism, stoked by fears of being overrun by immigrants from the East. Virulent anti-Semitism, German nationalism, anti-Slavism, and anti-Catholicism. With no prospects, Hitler joins the army and becomes a decorated soldier during the Great War. He is wounded at the Battle of the Somme in 1916 and temporarily blinded in a gas attack in 1918. 
Historians generally agree that Hitler's murderous anti-Semitism emerged after Germany's defeat in World War I as a product of the paranoid stab-in-the-back explanation for the catastrophe. That is, the German army did not lose the war, but was instead betrayed by civilians on the home front, especially the so-called November criminals, politicians, socialists, communists, Jews, and even Catholics. Oh, this, this by the way, is a, uh, it's a caricature from an Austrian postcard from 1919. Weimar was to last 13 years, but everything that happens over this 10-month period, November to August, is a prelude to the rise of the Third Reich. We'll consider each of these events. On October 28, 1918, the German High Command, in a desperate final attempt to win the war, orders the formidable German fleet to do battle with the blockading German Navy. Kiel Naval Base mutiny, revolution ensues. Ernst Teschoff is a naval cadet officer in the boiler room of the battleship Helgoland, which is seriously damaged. Um, I'm going to just briefly read what happens. <coughs> Ernst is the officer in charge of the boiler room crew. He's talking, um, you'll hear um, his, uh, his explanation to the sailors at the time that the mutiny just began. And this is from actual events that were recorded historically. High above the steel shell of the boiler room, a choral chant began and barely penetrated the hiss and pump of the pistons. Our orders are to break the British blockade. We steam into the North Sea at 0200 hours, along with the rest of the fleet from Wilhelmshaven and Hamburg, and engage the enemy at first light. This is what we have been waiting for. <coughs> Seaman Varen picked up the nozzle of his turgid fire hose. There will be no engagement, he said calmly. Ernst could hardly believe what he was hearing. As you were, Seaman Varen. High above on deck, Ernst heard faint singing, as of a chorus. Solwitz, Ernst's card partner, and a baritone in his church choir dropped his shovel onto the steel floor and began to sing, Arise, ye prisoners of starvation. Yellow-suited stokers let their shovels clatter onto the deck and stepped away from their stations to gather in front of the board. One by one took up the chorus of the Internationale, tentatively at first, then with gusto. The harmonic resonance of the steel hull echoed and amplified their small choral until it melded with the engine's rumble. Ernst's brother, Leo, joins the mutineers. Within a week, the red flag of the socialists flies over every naval vessel in Kiel and Wilhelmshaven. The following day, a sailor's council takes control of the base. 40,000 sailors, soldiers, and dock workers are involved in the mutiny. Word spreads, join the revolt. Representatives of the mutineers disperse to all major German cities. Soldiers and sailors' councils are formed in days all over Germany with diverse demands, a spectrum from communism to democracy, pacifism, and anti-militarism. Each dot on this map of, of Germany is where one of these soldiers and sailors' councils have have formed, and it's all within about five days' time. That's how quickly the revolution. The revolt triggers the revolution, sweeps away the monarchy of Kaiser Wilhelm II, and ten months later, the Weimar democracy is born, a fragile infant fatally infected at birth by extremes of both the left and the right. November 9, 1918, Chancellor Max von Baden announces the Kaiser's abdication, then resigns himself and designates Friedrich Ebert as his successor, as Imperial Chancellor of all, Russia, of all Prussia. Huge crowds of demonstrators gather in the streets. Chancellor Ebert issues a proclamation asking the masses to remain quiet and go home. This is no way to end a revolution. <laughs> Chancellor Ebert and his Secretary of State, Philip Scheidemann, then go to the Reichstag building for lunch and sit at separate tables. They don't get on that well. A huge crowd assembles outside and there are calls for a speech. The Chancellor refuses, but Scheidemann rushes to a window facing the crowd. 
the moment that this picture is taken. According to Scheidemann's own recollection, someone tells him along the way that the Spartacist communist leader, Karl Liebknecht, intends to declare Germany a Soviet republic that very day. Scheidemann preempts him and makes a spontaneous speech that closes with these words. The old and rotten, the monarchy has collapsed, may live, live the German Republic. When he returns to the Reichstag dining room, Chancellor Ebert is pounds the with his fist right to claim the Republic. What becomes of the Republic the Constituent Assembly to decide. But it is too late. Weimar is prematurely born. The revolutionaries are inspired by the 1917 Russian Revolution and socialist ideas. Uprising is also a power struggle between the moderate social democrats led by Chancellor Ebert and the radical communists led by Karl Liebknecht and Red Rosa, Rosa Luxemburg, who had previously founded <coughs> and led the Spartacus League. The uprising comes to be known as the Spartacus Revolution. In the anxiety of the moment, with a communist revolution poised to overthrow the government, Chancellor makes a fatal, if understandable, All this mess is going on, the armistice must be signed. In the turmoil of this day, the Ebert government accepts the Allies' harsh terms for a truce. Two days later, on November 11th, Armistice Day, Center Party Deputy Matthias Erzberger signs the Armistice Agreement. At the 11th hour, on the 11th day of the 11th month, the Great War is over. Three years later, Matthias Erzberger, who signed the Armistice, will be assassinated for his signature on the, the hated document. The same murder, uh, he's uh, assassinated by organization Consul, the same murder organization that Erzberger so the headlines here, this is from the New York Times, Armistice, Armistice <coughs> signed, end of the war, Berlin seized by revolutionists, new chancellor begs for order. Meanwhile, the nation is in turmoil. Mutinous sailors, soldiers, and workers are still in the streets. The revolutionary councils still threaten the authorities throughout Germany. All through November 1918, there was a standoff between Ebert's government and left-wing revolutionaries. The government's patience wears thin under pressure from right-wing nationalists and monarchists. Army soldiers returning from the war are mobilized to fight the communists. But <coughs> the war is lost, they are tired, dispirited, and it is almost Christmas. They refuse to fight and disperse. Chancellor Ebert turns to right-wing paramilitary units known as Free Corps to take their place. Eventually, as many as 50,000 freebooters, as they call themselves, fight to destroy the left and restore the monarchy. Some are veterans. Others, like my protagonist Ernst Teshoff, are too young to have fought in the Great War, but eager to save the fatherland from communists and Jews. Two days before Christmas, 1918, a contingent of mutinous sailors storm East Chancellery and the royal palace and seize three ministers. There are a huge communist round street. Christmas Eve, 19. Miss Marine Brigade sets up bivouac tents in Berlin's beautiful park, the Tiergarten, then attack the royal palace and drive the sail marshal just before the free chorus. Something remarkable happens. A leftist civilian crowd assembles behind the Free Corps and infiltrates their ranks. <coughs> Only now did Ernst see that a large crowd of civilians had assembled behind the soldiers and artillery pieces, as if they were spectators at a sporting match. <coughs> Women and children stood in the mob's front line. Long live the revolution. No monarchist counter-revolution. Death to the monarchists. The crowd surged forward and began to infiltrate the rear units. Commoners mingled among the Hussarin and freebooters, whose weapons were still hot. One by one, women and children in threadbare coats, chanting, insulting, pleading, cajoling, seeped into the ranks. Let me shoot the bitches, Bear yelled. Hold your fire, Manfred said. Ernst froze. 
at his position even as the mob surged around him. A gray-haired woman crouched beside Ernst and looked into his eyes. Go home, young boy. You don't have to fight. We only want to be treated well, just like you. She reminded Ernst of his mother. The Free Corps stands down in a humiliating defeat. On New Year's Eve, 1918, the German Communist Party. The New Year brings a second wave of revolution. Huge demonstrations, the surging masses carry placards and banners, army troops sent to suppress them. Luda nicht scheißen, brother, don't, brothers, don't shoot. <coughs> Spartacus demonstrations began again on January 4th, 1919, and two days later, another general strike paralyzed Berlin. Once again, stores and factories closed. Transport and electricity were idled. Karl Liebknecht and the other left-wing leaders decided the time for a Soviet revolution had come. Hundreds of thousands of Berliners surged through the streets, occupying railroad stations and newspapers. And a unit of riflemen, wearing baggy pants and half-buttoned coats, seized the biggest prize of all, the Brandenburg Gate. They were a ragtag army with berets and old fedoras in place of steel helmets, galoshes and exhausted trench boots marching out of step and rifles held at every angle. Artisans and factory girls marched side by side, waving red flags, chanting slogans and trading insults with the social democrats who marched the other way on Wilhelmstrasse. the Vorwarts newspaper building. The freebooters execute occupiers on the spot. Others are shot after they... 50 lives in Berlin, including Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg, Rosa, who are arrested and summarily executed by Free Corps officers. When the fighting is over, Berliners are relieved. Ernst and the Marine Brigade Erhardt march through central Berlin to the cheers of thousands of Berliners celebrating the Free Corps and the end of the Red Terror. This is Captain Earhart on the other way. Uh, the most feared and respected of Free Corps commanders. After the Free Corps is demobilized, he forms the secret murder organization, Organization Consul, for which Ernst is a driver and accessory to murder. The unholy alliance of Weimar politicians and the Free Corps succeeds in suppressing leftist uprisings throughout Germany, and the country is mostly pacified by August of 1919. As the German Revolution ebbs and flows from small rebellion to incendiary revolution, Hitler lays in a hospital bed, temporarily blinded by a gas attack at the end of the war. When told of Germany's surrender and the forced abdication of the Kaiser, he says, it has all been in vain struggles to understand the sudden collapse just when it seemed the war was turning in Germany's favor. He describes in Mein Kampf his belief that Germany had not been defeated, it had been stabbed in the back by Jewish revolutionaries, Bolsheviks, socialists, Erzberger who signed the armistice, and Scheidemann who declared the republic. Germany had been betrayed by the November criminals. The 1919 Treaty of Versailles is harsh. It imposes punishing economic sanctions and levies heavy reparations. Most Germans see the treaty as an unjust humiliation. They especially object to Article 231, the War Guilt Clause, declaring Germany responsible for the war. That same month, August of 1919, Friedrich Ebert is constitutionally sworn in as Weimar's first Reich president, Germany's first ever democratically elected head of state who is also a commoner, a socialist, and a civilian. The Weimar Constitution offers the framework for a direct democracy, but it contains a poison pill, the notorious Article 48, which grants the president the authority to issue emergency decrees and rule against the majority in the Reichstag with the help of the army if need be. The president can dissolve the Reichstag, choose and dismiss the chancellor, and take charge if public security and order are seriously disrupted or endangered. 
Article 48 will be used several times from 1930 to 1933 and is instrumental in destroying the Weimar democracy. Over a seven-month period, August 1919 to March of 1920, Weimar gets a constitution, is burdened with the Treaty of Versailles, and is briefly overthrown by the Free Corps, what we in medicine call a near-death experience. But first, let's check in again with Hitler. After World War I, he returns to Munich and remains in the army. In July of 1919, as an intelligence officer, he's assigned to infiltrate the right-wing German Workers' Party. While monitoring the activities of that party, Hitler is attracted to the founder, Anton Drexler's anti-Semitic, nationalistic, anti-capitalist, and anti-Marxist philosophy. Drexler invites him to join the party, and Hitler accepts. Weimar's first year of life, 1920, begins with the Treaty of Versailles coming into force. Among other requirements, the German army is restricted to 100,000 men, and the paramilitary Free Corps is ordered demobilized. The highest ranking general of the Reichswehr, the German army, General Lutwitz, refuses to demobilize the Free Corps and conspires with Wolfgang Kopp and Captain Earhart's Marine Brigade to carry out a coup. On March 13, 1920, Ernst and 5,000 Free Corps soldiers march 12 miles to Berlin and overthrow Weimar. And there are many chilling descriptions of that march through, that 12-mile that march uh, through the countryside to Berlin. The, um, as they neared Berlin, the crescent moon disappeared over the western horizon and uncountable stars sparkled like finely ground salt on black velvet. Families living along the route of march would long remember the menacing percussion of boots and the ghost-like army that passed in the night. An early spring breeze stirred the brigade's red, white, and black flags. Streetlights turned night-shadowed faces blue-gray and reflected off their helmets, large red swastikas painted on each side. They marched through the night, and before dawn, they tightened their formation and began to sing. Swastika on helmet, colors of red, white, and black, the Earhart Brigade is marching to attack. Once again, the loyalty of the army is in doubt, and Chancellor Ebert and our government prudently flee Berlin after calling for a general strike. The coup is successful. The government is overthrown for four days. Civilian officials remain in Berlin. Posters sprout overnight appealing to Berliners for a general strike. Berlin supplies, gas, electricity, or transportation. After four days, collapse, COP resigns, and the Weimar government reasserts itself. They march out of Berlin, they shoot into a crowd that is hissing and booing them. As the COP puts first spectacularly and then fails, Hitler's German Workers' Party changes its name to the National Socialist German Workers' Party, the Nazi Party. Hitler designs the party's banner of a swastika in a white circle on a red background. When news of the COP putsch reaches he flies to Berlin hoping to participate, but is met at the airport by angry striking workers. He disguises himself with a false beard and passes as an accountant. <laughs> the defeat of the Kap Putsch for Berlin. Just after the failure of the Kap Putsch, Hitler is discharged from the army and begins working full time for the Nazi Party. The headquarters are in Munich, a hotbed of anti government German nationalists determined to crush Marxism and undermine the Weimar Republic. Uh, that first picture is children playing with stacks of marks. Enough for a loaf of bread. To get a sense of the dimensions of Germany's hyperinflation, in 1914, 4.2 marks bought. U.S. dollar. By 1923, 4.2 trillion marks buys one. Is tanking the mark worthless? In 1923, French and Belgian troops occupy the Ruhr Valley to extract payment for delinquent reparations. At the end of 1923, a new currency is introduced and the mark is stabilized. 
At the start of hyperinflation, Hitler is granted absolute power as Nazi party chairman. His vitriolic beer hall speeches are now attracting regular audiences. He speaks in larger halls to thousands and becomes adept at using populist themes, including the use of scapegoats who are blamed for Germany's economic hardships. He rants about a particular document, the Protocol of the Elders of Zion, a fabricated anti-Semitic text purporting to describe a global Jewish plan for domination of the world. It was first <coughs> published in Russia in 1903, and it becomes a critical influence on Hitler's thinking during this period. Distribution is financed by the Nazi party and in the US by Henry Ford, who prints and distributes half a million copies. Meanwhile, the Free Corps, after being officially disbanded following the Kapp Putsch in 1920, goes underground. They are still available to the government to suppress left-wing uprisings. Organization Consul, the murderous offspring of the Free Corps, begins a reign of terror, assassinating enemies of the right. At least 354 people are assassinated for political reasons between 1919 and 1922. The two most notable are Erzberger, and who signed the armistice, and in 1922, Walter Rodnow. Rodnow is an industrialist, a philosopher, enigmatic dreamer and politician, chosen as foreign minister, the highest ranking Jew in the Weimar democracy. Though Rodnow described as German first, Jewish last, he is still the target of anti-Semitic wrath. It is a difficult time in Germany. Hyperinflation, crushing reparations, the French taking a hard line and anger at Versailles. The stab in the back myth becomes a regular right-wing rallying cry. Anti-Semitism is shifting from a religious race. Eugenic theories, many espoused by American scientists, reinforce prevailing racial animus. Right-wing parties demand revocation of the equality granted Jews in 1871. Then Rottenau does the unthinkable. He negotiates a treaty that normalizes relations between the Soviet Union and Germany. Organization Consul sees this as treason, a compromise with Bolshevism. A chorus of condemnation of the Treaty of Rapallo by the right-wing press and politicians motivates the assassins. On June 24, 1922, Rottenau is assassinated. Ernst Teschoff is the driver for the assassination, an accessory to the murder. Huge crowds mourn Rottenau's <coughs> death. He was a beloved politician, he was a beloved statesman, though not to the nationalists and monarchists. At Rottenau's funeral, Chancellor Wirt declares, the enemy is on the right. Flags are at half mast, trade unions stage mass demonstrations in mourning and protest. Reich President Ebert issues a decree for the protection of the Republic that creates a special court that brings an end to the organization consul murders. In the wake of Rodnow's assassination, Germany suffers accelerated hyperinflation, the collapse of the economy, the French invasion of the Ruhr Valley, and Hitler's attempted beer hall putsch in Bavaria. This is a photograph taken at the trial, and here is is my protagonist. This is Ernst Werner Teschoff in the trial. This is his brother, Hans Ger Teschoff, who was also a co-conspirator in, the, in the, uh, that murder organization. Rottenau's <coughs> mother, Matilda Rottenau, attends Ernst's trial. Before he is sentenced, she asks the judge to read out loud her letter to Ernst's mother. In the letter, she offers Ernst her forgiveness for murdering her son if he will confess before an earthly judge and repent before the court. In my fiction, this actual letter becomes the fulcrum of Ernst's complex and harrowing redemption. Ernst escapes the death penalty <coughs> and is sentenced to 15 years, of which he only serves seven. The Weimar Republic is continually under assault from both left-wing and right-wing extremists. The left accuses the social Democrats of betraying the workers' movement and unleashing the free corps upon the workers. The right is opposed to any democratic system, seeking instead an authoritarian state and return of the monarchy. Both sides are determined to bring down Weimar. On the anniversary of Germany signing the armistice, November 9, 1923, Hitler attempts to 
the beer, which, along with two takes parts of Munich, arrests the president of Bavaria and the chief of police and forces them to endorse the Nazi takeover and its objective to overthrow the Weimar government. The army and police are called in and put down Hitler's rebellion after a confrontation in which 16 Nazis and four policemen are killed. Three benefits accrue to Hitler uh, from his failed Beer Hall Putsch. First, the Putsch itself and his 24-day trial gave, give Hitler a platform for his nationalist sentiments and the attention of the German nation. Hitler is found guilty of treason and sentenced to five years in Landsberg prison. He uses his time in prison to dictate Mein Kampf and is released after only nine months. The final benefit, and the most profound, is the insight that the path to power is through legitimate means rather than revolution or force. Hyperinflation ends and sanity seems to return to Germany and abroad. The government is stable and conservative. In September 1926, Germany is admitted to the League of Nations, another step toward <coughs> normalizing its status in world affairs. German industry is modernizing, business is stable, wages high, unemployment low. This is a time of artistic exuberance, and Germany is at the epicenter of experimentation and creativity. In the 1920s, Germany emerges as a leading center of the avant-garde, the birthplace of expressionism in painting and sculpture. Kandinsky, Franz Marc, Paul Klee, of the atonal music of Arnold Schoenberg, and the jazz-influenced work of Paul Hindemith and Kurt Weill. Such films as The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari and Nosferatu bring expressionism to cinema. The Nazis view Weimar's cultural experimentation with disgust. It is degenerate art. Their response stems partly from a conservative aesthetic <coughs> taste and partly from their determination to use culture as a propaganda tool. In this regard, they have the support of the Protestant church against secular, liberal, and excess. At the very beginning of this, this was the first international Dada fair in Berlin. The African-American performer Josephine Baker is an overnight sensation in Berlin's cabaret scene in December of 1925. George Grosch was a, a, Grosch was a communist and a Dada artist who created caricatures of biting criticism about Berlin in the 20s. According to the Nazis, his work was a prime example of degenerate art. As a cultural response to all this, the Nazis <coughs> condemn new art forms and nurture a right-wing youth, including a conservative view of the women in society, children, kitchen, and church. <coughs> this is the girls' wing of the Nazi party youth movement, the Hitler Youth. It is the only Nazi-inspired female youth organization. Once the Nazis seize power, membership becomes compulsory. Before the stock market crash, the Nazis and their allies flounder. Peace and cause. Between the elections of 1924 and 1928, the Nazi share of the vote declines from 3% to 2.6%. Even before the Great Depression, the foundation of Weimar is rotting. Among the hidden flaws, government corruption is revealed, industries and businesses are merging, powerful industrial magnates who had grown rich in speculation during the inflation gain control of newspapers and information, reparations remain burdensome, communist unrest persists, the army is still unreliable, right-wing fanatics continue to call for the overthrow of Weimar, responds with death. Alfred Hugenberg, a name should know, one of Germany's leading media moguls, rather like Rupert Murdoch, takes over as head of Germany's other right-wing party, the German National Workers' Party, and makes overtures to Hitler. At this time, Hugenberg is the lead politician calling for the overthrow of Weimar. He will be instrumental in helping Hitler become chancellor, and he serves in Hitler's first cabinet in 1933 fully expecting to control Hitler and use him as his tool. 
Nazi leadership finds respectability among military men, agrarians and large estate owners, the Junkers, monarchists and industrialists anxious to cripple socialist trade unions and protect their profits. The weight that finally breaks Weimar's back, the Great Depression, is that most onerous, unpredictable, and treacherous of Jochen Bittner's four conditions that cleared the path for the rise of the Third Reich. Even before the stock market crash of October 1929, the precarious German prosperity is beginning to founder with rising unemployment and declining tax collection. The Great, Dis the Great Depression is most disastrous for the least stable regime, Germany, which depends on foreign aid and investment, German exports fall, foreign loans are not renewed, tax income drops, bankruptcies multiply, unemployment, unemployment grows dramatically. Hitler and the Nazi party prepare to take advantage of the emergency to gain support. They promise to repudiate the Versailles Treaty, rescue the economy, provide jobs, keep immigrants out, purify German culture, make Germany great again. In the election of September 1930, the Nazi party wins 18.3% of the vote becoming the second largest party in parliament. The new chancellor, Heinrich Brüning of the Center Party, invokes Article 48 to implement austerity measures which bring little economic relief and are extremely unpopular. Hitler exploits this by targeting Germans who are most affected, such as farmers, war veterans, and the middle class. There are violent street brawls between Nazis and communists. As extremist parties on the left and right gain power, subsequent governments invoke Article 48 when they too find it impossible to obtain a parliamentary majority. Governance by decree becomes the new norm. The power to rule by decree becomes a substitute for parliamentary leadership, another step on the slope to In 1932, Hitler runs for president and finishes to Paul von Hindenburg with 35% of the vote. He is now to be reckoned with. A group of industrial elites led by Albert Hugenberg, the head of the Austrian party, convinced Hindenburg to appoint Hitler as chancellor. On June 30th, 1933, Hitler is named chancellor. A month later, the Reichstag is set afire by a lone, deranged Dutch anarchist. Hitler blames communists suspends civil liberties and begins mass arrests. Concentration camps are established for communists and social democrats. At Hitler's urging, President von Hindenburg enacts the Reichstag Fire Decree, which suspends basic civil liberties and allows detention without trial. The decree is permitted under Article 48 of the Weimar Constitution. Activities of the German Communist Party are suppressed and some 4,000 communists are arrested. Six days later, the election of March 5, 1933, the Nazi party wins 44% of the vote. Three weeks after that, Hitler's government brings the Enabling Act to a vote in the newly elected Reichstag, and Hindenburg signs it. The Enabling Act, officially titled the Law to Remedy the Distress of People and the Reich, gives laws, even ones that deviate from the Weimar Constitution, without the consent of the Reichstag for four years basically martial law, and the Third Reich is born. Hitler worked his will legally and took advantage of Weimar's fatal flaws. He articulated people's fears, their rage, their humiliation. They had been left behind and betrayed by a ruined economy, a degenerate culture, by women making free choices, by communists, by Jews, Slavs, Romani, immigrants. He gave voice to their fear of the other, he gave credibility to eugenic theories that reinforced their own biases of Aryan superiority. In exchange, the German people, ordinary people no different than you and me, gave Hitler the reins of a dictatorship that would commit extraordinary crimes. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, a civil rights leader and a progressive Jewish theologian, observed about the Holocaust, few are guilty, all are responsible. We hear an echo of Weimar today in our political discourse. No one of us can reverse this disturbing reverberation, but each one of us can do something, no matter how small, to further decency, tolerance, and respect for all people. George Santayana warned us to remember history or repeat it. 
Some choose to willfully forget or ignore history. Before the court of heaven is one small effort. Two thousand years ago, another Hebrew sage, Harfon, asked, "Now are we free to descend from it?" Thank you for your attention. So I, I'd love to entertain questions, comments, discussion um, from folks. And, and I, so yes, please. Why, why was it called the Weimar Republic? Uh, it's a good question. Vi Weimar, the city of Weimar, is pretty much in the middle of Germany. Um, they didn't want it to be associated with Berlin, and they also didn't feel that they that the representatives to the new democracy would be safe in Berlin because of the uh, the revolution that was going on there. Um, and Weimar was also a place of great cultural importance to German to Germans, um, and so that was chosen as the site of the. And by the way, it wasn't called the Weimar Republic during all this time. You know, I've been saying Weimar, Weimar Republic, Weimar Republic. It was called the German Empire. It was called the Deutsche Reich at that time. The, the term Weimar Republic started being used maybe in 1930 or 31. Yes, Ellen. Can I ask, in, in real life, not in the fictional end, which I think Jessica will have to read, but <laughs> in real life, what happened to your protagonist after the trial? OK. Uh, um, so we know some of what happened to Ernst Teshoff. And there is it, what his redemption is probably a fable. So, and there's no, it's not really clear. His historical trail runs cold, and we don't really know. Martin Sabrov, who's a noted German historian, uh, says that he was killed in a prisoner of war camp, Soviet prisoner of war camp, at the end of the war, he, he, that he was in the Navy and was captured and became a prisoner of war. But we don't really, we don't really know what actually happened to him. So the it, trial? The trial is real, yes, that is absolutely real. And, and the first half of this book is all documented uh, historically correct material. The, the trial is chilling, and when you re when you read the you know what these people are saying, it, it's it, it's both a circus and chilling. And what was his penalty? He was sentenced to 15 years in prison as an accessory to murder. He was he could have been sentenced to death, and they were they were bringing uh, capital charges against him. He got off with 15 years. And he served all. He only served seven. And what happens to him in prison? No spoiler alert, <laughs> so I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> yes? Um, since you made reference to um, Santayana's um, quote, both at the beginning and the end, it indicates to me how immensely important that is. And I don't know how many years ago you started this book, but I guess for me and maybe for others as well, the elephant in the room is Donald Trump and the similarities between. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I um, I I didn't I, I didn't mention Lord Voldemort purposely, <laughs> so I leave it for, for your for you. Um, uh, I I started the book in 1992, so I'm the world's slowest writer. So <laughs> that has been 24 years in the making. Um, but it, it is remarkable in this last year, as the book is coming to publication. Um, how timely this story is, and um, so I, I was not anticipating that in in my writing, and it was certainly not my not my intention to a political point. But um, it seems that the times have caught up with. Well, so what I'm asking you is, is when we hear these lessons from history and not just get reminded of the pain and horror of it and get moved to paralysis. Since mm -hmm. we're in a living time where we have choices and action, um, to to know what things like this could lead to, do you have any specific recommendations? Yeah, yeah. T talk to Ellen and Frank. <laughs> oh, they'll give you lots to do. And Spence. <laughs> <laughs> Historians don't have crystal balls. 
Oh, good, yes. Frank said historians don't have crystal balls, and I'm not a historian anyway, so, and I'm not a politician, so I'm a scribbler and, you know, uh, hopefully a thoughtful one. Um, so I, I leave it, and that's why I read that last quote from Rabbi Tarfan, that it is, it, we don't have the choice of desisting from this, from this work. So you miss an opportunity, and the advice is to read the book. <laughs> uh, but I, I think the big problem today is that most people just aren't aware of the history. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I yeah. think that's something that's dogged the American political scene for, for a long time, forever probably. Mm -hmm. But as Americans, we just, many of us just are not, are totally out of touch with this. Yeah, and it's, w w learned this history, I, I was blown away before I was, like, oh my God, this, how did I get through college and not know this amazing the history of what went on revolution in germany i you know maybe i heard about it but i, I mean the, the things that went you couldn't make up this stuff you know if you if you made up this stuff as a fiction writer people say you were well, so, and this is what happened so yeah the, i mean we need to have and and is again that you know um, young people will want to read this book and be perhaps compelled by this history as much as I was in a, in a, in a fiction form that may be more animated for them and give them, get, make it more, make it feel like something more that's, that's digestible and, and informative. Brent. Um, I just want to tell a little, per, a little personal uh, reflection on this. My mother was born in Germany in 1918. So her whole, the first 20 years of her life, basically, is Mm -hmm. um, so I heard growing up, I heard stories about this. One of the things that talked, she didn't talk about that revolution because she was only a year old, but her father had, had been drafted into the German army. He was, a pe he was a pediatrician, but he was forced to be a soldier. He was mm -hmm. an intern in, uh, in England and almost died as a prisoner of war. And when he returned to Germany in 1918, she said his health was shattered, his faith, his religious faith was shattered, and he became one of these people who just could not deal with politics. And plus, he was a professor, so he, he the, the, the academics just wouldn't engage in politics. And so this whole thing went on, and they were, and she said they would say things like, well, Hitler is a flash in the pan, it's not going to last, it's smarter than this. But she also told stories about the hyperinflation and mm -hmm. about her mother would go, as soon as the paycheck would come, she would rush to the store in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. Teen, when she was 15 years old, 1933, Hitler was elected, and five years later, you know, they lived through that whole five years before 1938 and, and escaped in March of 1938 because her mother was Jewish. Mm -hmm. So. There's nothing in here that is made up. <laughs> it's all, yeah. Yeah, it's all yeah. stuff that, yeah. you know, I, I paid attention to this mm -hmm. and I spent some time thinking about it, but the way you put it, put it in there about the poison pill and the Act 48 and all of that stuff, that really brings, brings up why this happened. And it wasn't just a yeah. fluke, and it wasn't just the people not paying attention, but they were the right and the left yeah. and the yeah. ratings yeah. and yeah. Yeah. Public, and that's, that's yeah. exactly what yeah, and, and I, I also had, as, as primary sources for research for this book, were both of my parents who escaped um, Germany just before the Holocaust. Some other of my family did not. Um, but my, um, I learned that my grandfather was arrested on Kristallnacht and was sent to Dachau. That my, my mother, we went back to Mainz with my mother where she grew up, and uh, she showed us all of the places of her youth and the place where the, the French soldiers, the occupying soldiers during 1923, were, uh, were in Mainz and uh, causing a lot of anxiety. So, yeah, and, the, and there are just few witnesses left to, to carry this story, and it makes it all again challenging how to how to present this history to another generation of people one further generation removed from being witnesses. George.
I, I don't know the answer to that question, George. I, um, I, you know, it's, it's I, I don't know how well, did you folks? It's better known in Germany. Better known in Germany. Yeah. About, you mean about Vi well, Weimar, the, the whole, the larger, yeah. the larger story, yeah. yeah. General yeah. history. Yeah. How about Ernst Aaron, oh, yeah. Teshoff? Yeah. Uh, probably, I, that kind of detail, probably not by the, by the public, but yeah. by scholars, of course. It's a, yeah. it's a pretty s small piece of history, and again, the, the, the historical trail is, is not particularly uh, robust. So. Yeah. Oh sure, yeah. He, he was wanting to know how much of this story is known in Germany, and what sort of what what is next for this book. I don't know what's next for the book. I, it's 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 still in its cradle. So <laughs> maybe it'll, maybe it'll go to college. <laughs> um, you guys are my marketing <laughs> committee. So um, I, I you know I had a publisher to publish this book. And they went bankrupt. <laughs> so I just published it myself. So um, it, it was, I, I, I did very well with Life in a Jar, publishing that myself. That did extraordinarily well, um, and still does. Um, so I'm, I, I'm hopefully getting some boost from, from that. And, and it also has, done, has won a number of book awards. And so it, it, you know, marketing is a little crazy. Not a little crazy. It's certifiably insane. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so I'm, I'm trying my best to, to learn how to do that, and I have, um, have some help with that. But it's challenging. Anyone who's tried to publish a book knows that. Can you yeah. get national distribution that way? Pardon me? Can you get national distribution that way? Oh, I, it's national distributed. I mean, it's on Amazon, and bookstores can order it. So I have a, I have a distributor, Ingram Books, that distributes oh, okay. it. But so it's, yes? Oh no! I knew this would be fiction when I started, um, and, and really, it's my preference is to write fiction. When I life in a jar, it was when I was asked to write the book. I told Norm Canard, who started the project, I said, "I don't write nonfiction." So I was <laughs> I sort of dragged kicking and screaming into that. Pro well, not kicking and screaming, but I, it, it needed enticement. So my my. This is fiction, certainly. Other, other questions? Janet. This is a personal opinion. I think oh. Trump is a neo-Nazi. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave that there. <laughs> Janet. Um, you could have written about... Oh, Ken, I'm sorry, Ken. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Good, good question. Uh, you know, when I first heard, I first heard this story at a young, and you don't usually think of stories of Nazis at Yom Kippur sermons. Um, so I, I, that was right away sort of shocking and got my attention. But hearing the, the story about the letter that Rodnow's mother writes, this letter of that's, I, I think that was the hook <coughs> for me, and how that then became the agent of his redemption later on. Um, and the complex, I'm just trying to understand how complex it is for people who are so evil as to be a, a proto-Nazi assassin can, um, can turn from evil and correct their lives. It's, a, it's not a simple process. You don't just turn that leaf over. Um, so I was fascinated by the human drama of that change. How, how the arc of development of, of a character can be so dramatic from, uh, from being out as a Nazi as that. I think with, with right, it's the, the story comes first. You grab the throat, it's, you're, you're not going to be able to write it well. This story had me by Well, 
a, 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 a wonderful editor named Michael Lowenthal. I don't know if any, he's a novelist. I don't know if any of you have read his stuff, but if you haven't, I, I would urge you to read it. He's a beautiful writer. Um, and um, I, I think I, I may not tell this story about how uh, Jay Perini w had first, um, I, I worked with Jay at Breadloaf on the first chapter of, of the book, and he, su he suggested Mike as an editor. Um, I called up Mike, and he said, no. I've got notes all over my house, st sticky notes all over the house saying, t say no, do not accept anything else. <laughs> he's, this, he's this really busy guy. I mean, a, he was teaching at Boston College then and was writing his own work, and he was just overwhelmed. He said, no, 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 no. And, and, and then as we're about to get off the phone, and I'm very disappointed, he says, by the way, do you have a son named Alex? <laughs> I said, yeah, I do. And he said, did, was he a camper at Farm and Wilderness Camp in <laughs> Plymouth, Vermont? I said, yeah, he was. Oh, I know, Alex. He was, he, he was his counselor. He taught, he, he taught him how to play, play the banjo. He was, so he knew Alex really well from a couple of years of being his counselor at camp. Then the whole conversation turned around, and he says, uh, oh, I'd be happy to look at your <laughs> <laughs> So. I just want to say, I probably owe this whole, the, whatever success comes out of this, I really owe to my son. <laughs> um, but, uh, so the, and the revision of the manuscript went on and on and on and on. And I, I, someone, I, I think it was Hemingway, maybe it wasn't, who, when asked why he publishes books, he said, so I stop revising them. <laughs> you know, I, totally, I totally get that, you know. <laughs> yeah. You know, I have for Life in a Jar, but th you are the first audience for Before the Court of Heaven. This, this is the launch. <laughs> so. <laughs>